All right. Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the Washington and Lee Law Library, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Andrew Christensen. I'm one of the librarians here in the law school, and I also teach legal research. It's wonderful to see so many of you here um, who I recognize from our student body, from our faculty, from our staff, uh, but also others from front campus and the broader community. Welcome to the law school. Uh, you're for a true treat this evening. You're going to hear from not three, not four, but five of our WNL Law faculty members who are nationally recognized uh, scholars and practitioners in various areas of criminal justice. Uh, they'll deliver their thoughts inspired by a book that's also nationally recognized uh, as a gripping, eye-opening, emotional account of a young black lawyer's struggles and accomplishments in representing death row prisoners and other vulnerable and disadvantaged defendants in the American South. That book is Just Mercy, and the author is Brian Stevenson, a public interest lawyer and director of the Equal Justice Initiative based in Alabama and also a professor at NYU School of Law. By the way, Professor Stevenson will be delivering the commencement address here at WNL Law uh, graduation ceremony coming up on May 10th. And I'd like to say thanks to all the people who made the event tonight possible, uh, including my colleagues in the law library um, and especially our director, Alex Zhang, for her ideas and initiatives uh, for the program. Thanks to our administrative assistant, Allegra Steck, for coordinating the, uh, the reception that will follow the discussion tonight at 6.30. Um, thanks to Dean Brant Helwig uh, for his support and leadership, and to Dean Trinae Mason and Wendy Raines in the Student Affairs Office for their advice and assistance. Thanks, of course, to Pete Jatan, our Director of Communications, uh, for arranging the video recording this evening. The entire event will be uh, video recorded and will be posted in WNL Law Library's online collection for public view. And perhaps the biggest thanks to our faculty panel for offering their time and insights to all of us. Professor Bruck, Professor Demleitner, uh, Professor Hasbrook, Professor Shapiro, and uh, special thanks to Professor King, who will be our masterful moderator this evening. Um, you couldn't ask uh, for a more experienced and thoughtful um, lineup of experts on these topics, and we're thrilled that they all uh, accepted the invitation to speak tonight. Um, so thanks again to you all. And just a few more words of background before I turn it over to Professor King and the panel. So Just Mercy is an extraordinary book, um, which those of, you, uh, those of you who've read it know. And Professor Stevenson, speaking at this year's graduation, gives us a great opportunity to read it and celebrate it. But for those who are not aware, this is the fifth year in a row that the Law Library has hosted an event similar to this, uh, with viewpoints from our law faculty and sometimes professors from, uh, um, from other university departments on interesting, <coughs> timely, and otherwise remarkable uh, works of popular fiction or nonfiction that have a connection to the law. So we began this in 2015 with Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, and tonight, with Just Mercy, we're discussing a book that comes in a close second to that timeless classic, as a story that I've heard students say inspired them to go to law school, perhaps to pursue a career in public interest or criminal defense, uh, or to enroll in a class or a clinic here that deals with the issues of inequality, corruption, and even inhumanity uh, in our justice system, justice system that are laid bare in Just Mercy. It's a powerful book. It's a sobering book. It's a shocking and saddening and maddening book in many ways. But it also serves as a platform for positive discussion and potential reform, as evidenced by the attendance here tonight and the conversations that we'll be having uh, re that reflect our concern as lawyers, educators, students, and Americans for exposing and challenging what's wrong uh, with, with our institutions and attitudes as they impact the reality of justice in our country. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor King. Uh, J.D. King is a clinical professor of law and the director of experiential education and the director of the criminal justice clinic here at the law school. Among the classes he teaches are criminal procedure, first year criminal law, um, and his scholarship has appeared in numerous publications including the Washington Lee Law Review, Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review, University of Pennsylvania Journal of International Law, and most recently the Georgetown Law Journal. Before coming to Washington and Lee, J.D. was supervising attorney at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. And thanks again, everyone, for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to J.D. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. And um, thank you to the Law Library and the Dean's Office, um, and especially to Andrew Christensen for making all this possible and for getting all these wonderful copies of this amazing book. Um, I am really just so happy to be here tonight uh, and to be with some of my absolutely favorite people and, and talking about this amazing book. Um, I love this event. I love that with the law school, the entire community comes together once a year and reads the same book and talks about it, and I just love this book. Um, Brian Stevenson said we have a system of justice that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. 
And he said, wealth, not culpability, determines outcomes in the criminal justice system. <clears throat> and I don't think anyone who's involved with the criminal justice system today honestly could disagree with that. Um, I reread this book recently. I read it when it first came out, and I reread it recently to get ready for this event. And one of the things that struck me about Just Mercy is the hopeful tone of this book. Um, Brian Stevenson's described some of the darkest places, the most tragic situations in America, but always does so from a place of hope. Um, not, not naive hope, um, but hope. Uh, and one of the stories that sticks with me, um, and those of you who've read the book I'm sure remember this, is his description when he goes to a prison um, and he sees a truck out in the parking lot. Do you remember this story? And the truck's got, um, you know, he, Confederate flags and what he calls bumper stickers um, that are symbols of racial hatred. And he goes in to see his client um, who's on death row in this prison and has this interaction with a white guard who's very hostile to him and everything he's doing. And the, the guard says to him, after you know, forcing him to, to undergo a strip search, notwithstanding the fact that he's a lawyer and going through all of his um, um, uh, papers and sort of humiliating him gratuitously, the guard looks at Brian Stevens and says, did you see that truck out there in the parking lot with the flags and the bumper stickers? I want you to know that's my truck. And Brian Stevenson goes on and does his job and meets with his client, and they have a uh, three-day hearing uh, in some distant courthouse that this prison guard transported Brian Stevenson's client to. And he comes back after this uh, three-day hearing, and he's got to come see his client again, and he encounters the same prison guard. And he describes in the book sort of girding himself when he comes in for another similar um, degrading interaction with this, with this prison guard. Um, and I just want to read a, a little bit of what he said when he came back. The, the guard saw Brian Stevenson and treated him very differently. He said, oh no, Mr. Stevenson, you don't need to undergo the strip search. I signed you into the book already. You know, come on in. <clears throat> and he, did, he revealed his own, the guard revealed his own history of, of childhood abuse and, and uh, time in the foster care system, much like Stevenson's client. And I just read a short bit from the book on page 201 here. Uh, he says, the guard reached into his pocket to pull out a handkerchief to wipe away the perspiration that had formed on his brow. I noticed for the first time that he had a Confederate flag tattooed on his arm. You know, I guess what I'm trying to say, the guard said, is that I think it's good what you're doing. I got so angry coming up that there were plenty of times when I really wanted to hurt somebody just because I was angry. I made it to 18, joined the military, and you know I've been okay, but sitting in that courtroom brought back memories, and I think I realize I'm still kind of angry. I smiled. He continued. Guard says, that expert doctor you put up said that some of the damage that's done to kids in these abusive homes is permanent. That kind of made me worry. Do you think that's true? Stevenson said, oh, I think we can always do better. The bad things that happen to us don't define us. It's just important sometimes that people understand where we're coming from. We were both speaking softly to one another. Another officer walked by and stared at us. I went on, you know, I really appreciate you saying to me what you just said. It means a lot. I really mean that. Sometimes I forget how we all need mitigation at some point. So I think the book speaks to a broader topic that we really need right now, not just about the criminal justice system, but of a hope in speaking across divides. Uh, and, this, this, um, and then he ends that, that scene, that vignette with the prison guard, that the prison guard said he had stopped when he was transporting Stevenson's client back up from the courthouse to the prison, pulled off the highway and said, I probably wasn't supposed to do this, but I stopped and got us both chocolate milkshakes. Okay? Um, so there is something um, very, very hopeful about that, even within his description of a system that is broken. The stories that he describes, that Stevenson describes in Just Mercy, are happening today. Um, my students in the clinic, we were just studying a case involving uh, racial, racially biased strikes, racially motivated strikes in jury selection. And this case that we were studying about, some of you probably know about it, <clears throat> involved a white prosecutor in Mississippi who over the course of several murder trials against the same defendant exercised 41 out of 42 strikes against African American defendants, resulting in white or almost all white juries. This case that we were studying is not from 1932, and it's not from 1958. It's from last Wednesday when we went up to the Supreme Court and heard it. Okay, this is Flowers versus Mississippi that some of you might know about. Um, and so these cases are happening today that he described. 
the routine processing and caging of poor people and people of color happens every day, today, in courthouses across the country. And so I'll just say this and then and get on to the panel. The fight to get people out of prisons and jails and the fight for dignity and sanity in our criminal justice process is the civil rights struggle of our generation, I think. And to the law students out there, I think that is the struggle that I invite you and, and Just Mercy invites you to get involved with in whatever way you can. I hope you all found this book as inspiring as I did and take up the challenge that Stevenson gives us all, which is to make this a more just, a more compassionate, more gentle system. Like I said, I couldn't be more thrilled to be here with this group of people. You are all in for a treat. This is a truly remarkable panel of experts. I'm going to introduce them all now, so I won't interrupt them. And I'm going to do my best to just stay out of their way for the rest of this hour. <laughs> John Shapiro is one of the best criminal defense lawyers in the country, and he has been for decades. Um, uh, John has represented uh, clients like John Muhammad in the Beltway Sniper case, accused spies uh, Harold Nicholson and Brian Regan, and countless others, uh, both retained and appointed clients. John taught at American University's legal clinic in addition to practicing law for the last uh, 40 or so years. Um, and he's been with us for the last uh, eight or nine years here at WNL. <clears throat> he's won a number of awards, including from his alma mater, American University, the Peter Cicino Alumni Award for Outstanding Advocacy in the Public Interest. And just last year, John won the Elliott Milstein Award for Professional Excellence in Clinical Le Legal Education. I've had the pleasure of teaching with John, running the clinic with John, and uh, you couldn't ask for uh, a better commentator on this. Nora Demleitner is one of the uh, uh, leading national experts in the law of sentencing and collateral consequences. She's one of the editors of the Federal Sentencing Reporter. Uh, she's served as a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg, Germany. She's a member of the American Law Institute, uh, and she has published uh, countless articles on the issues of sentencing, collateral consequences, legal education, uh, international comparative sentencing law, uh, and many other things, including in the Stanford Law Review, Minnesota Law Review, and the Michigan Law Review. Brandon Hasbrook is our newest member of the faculty, having joined us just this past fall as visiting assistant professor of law. Um, he graduated from WNL Law School in 2011. While he was here, he was the editor-in-chief of the uh, WNL Law Review and inducted into such organizations as the Order of the Coif and uh, ODK. Uh, after law school, Brandon sort of wandered in the wilderness, uh, <laughs> scraping by with such jobs as clerking for Judge Emmett Sullivan, Sullivan on U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia and Judge Roger Gregory in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, he then couldn't find anything else to do, and so he, he litigated at Debevoise and Plimpton up in New York and then McGuire Woods uh, in Richmond. All four of those are some of the most prestigious jobs you can have. <laughs> His article, Saving Justice, uh, will be coming out later this year in the Georgetown Law Journal. Finally, David Bruck runs our death penalty clinic, the Virginia Capital Case Clearinghouse. Um, he is uh, one of the best capital defense lawyers in the country, and, and uh, any time a big capital case comes up, you will hear David's name associated with possibly representing that person. David has represented uh, recently Dylan Roof, Shokar Sarnayev, uh, and uh, prior to that, Susan Smith. Uh, some high-profile cases. Uh, before teaching, David served as a public defender and then the head of the public defender office in Richland County, South Carolina, um, and, and was also in private practice doing criminal defense and capital defense. David's argued seven times before the U.S. Supreme Court, most notably his unopposed motion to have me admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court, <laughs> which I guess doesn't even count as an argument, but um, I count it as a victory. <laughs> David has received uh, awards for his work, too numerous to mention. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Shapiro. Thanks, J.D. Uh, first off, I, I need to correct something immediately. I've been a practicing lawyer for 45 years, not 40. And I want credit for every one of those years. Uh, it should also be mentioned that uh, David came very close to losing the motion to have J.D. admitted to the <laughs> Supreme Court. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great to see so many uh, friends and colleagues here, all brought together by Brian Stevenson's moving memoir. Um, 
I'm really looking forward to seeing here, seeing him here in a few weeks. This guy has done so much for racial <clears throat> justice in our country, which ultimately means he's done so much for justice in our country. As a matter of fact, in the week before our graduation here, my daughter Lucy and I are taking a road trip uh, to Montgomery to check out the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, sometimes referred to as the Lynching Memorial, uh, which exists because of Brian Stevenson and his organization. Um, it is supposed to just drain all the words from you. And I'm looking forward uh, to seeing that. If you can't get there, you should really check out uh, each Equal Justice Initiative's interactive map of lynchings, which is a real shocker. And I'm going to just try and, with um, Andrew's help, yeah. maybe. The Firefox logo at the bottom. There you go. This one. Okay, so you're now seeing a map of all the documented lynchings in the United States um, from mid 1800s forward, and you can click on any county you like and see who and how many were lynched there. It is really quite something, uh, including my home city of Alexandria, which documents two lynchings. Uh, uh, one of which was as late as um, the 1920s, I believe. Uh, in any event, uh, I really wanted this talk to be uplifting, uh, but I've got to warn you that um, for the most part it's a real bummer. Um, and my fear is that um, any of you who were thinking of doing Brian's uh, noble work are going to leave here and say, no way. Uh, there is good news at the end of my little talk. Um, some of you know me. I've done a handful of death penalty cases over the year, years. You all also uh, may know uh, all of my clients except one uh, have been put to death. Uh, so when I first read uh, took out Brian Stevenson's book in 2015 when it was published. I got into it maybe about 30 pages and I had to stop. Uh, it was just too much for me. Um, the things he described, those uh, painful meetings with the family of the condemned, as they're referred to, uh, vengeful and bitter prosecutors' offices, bogus evidence, uh, hostile courtrooms, stone-cold appellate judges, death row, the death chamber, uh, someone set to die because he had horrible lawyering. Uh, I had been there many times, and I knew the frequent end of the stories Brian was telling, and I really just could not bear uh, to go there again and finish the book. Um, in particular, the the memory of one of my cases is something that I visit every day. If you've ever been up to my office, you'll see a picture of my client on the, hanging on the wall, uh, Wilbert Evans. Uh, so like the story Brian tells in his book, this was a case where the state contrived to get the death penalty through lies and false evidence. They lied in order to kill this man. And this isn't just me talking. Uh, if you look at Justice Marshall's uh, opinion descending from the denial of cert in this case, uh, he sets out in detail and with outrage the outrageous conduct um, which led to the death sentence for Evans. And I did say that was a dissent. Um, it was a, an opinion which I handed to my client on the last day of his life on death row before they took him to uh, the electric chair and he wrote on it, bury this with me, uh, something I will never forget. And this wasn't Mississippi or Alabama. Uh, it was right up the road in Alexandria. Uh, it was also a case in which almost everyone agreed that death was not appropriate. But unfortunately, 
the uh, machinery of death, as Justice Blackman called it, had been put into gear, and it's exceedingly difficult to stop once it's um, been put into gear. So, as I said, my first experience in trying to read Stevenson's book was a bad one. Uh, and with that light note as preface, let me show you some other really distressing uh, data. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, there is a website maintained by a project maintained by the University of Michigan <coughs> Law School. It's called the Exoneration Registry, um, which documents all the exonerations that have happened in the country since just 1985 or 89. You can look at this and you'll see 2,400 exonerations, there it is, since 1989. 21,000 years lost, okay, with an average of 8.8 .8 years per person exonerated. These are people who were sent to prison who were demonstrably not guilty. Um, and uh, as far as folks uh, who were condemned, sent to death row, who were later exonerated, the number, I was going to pull it up, I don't need to, is 164, with an average time uh, between their uh, uh, sentence and exoneration of 11 years. 164 people condemned to death wrongfully. Um, so how many people is that? Uh, I checked today. There are 130 people in the 1L class. All right? So it's more than the entire 1L class, only 110 in the 3L class. And if you're 22 years old entering law school, it would have meant that you spent all the time from age 11 until 22 before you were exonerated. The next time you find yourself in a cocktail party and someone is uh, asking you, you know, why do you represent those people? Just tell them to take a look at the exoneration uh, registry. Um, okay. Two things I've come to realize since doing um, death penalty work. Here's the first. Um, uh, I came to realize uh, it's not just the, the murdered citizens who are the victims. Victimhood cloaks everyone who comes into contact <coughs> with this system that we've established here. Let me just take you through it. There's the victim's family. Okay, I'm not talking about the defendant. I'm talking about the person who was murdered and their family, of course. Um, they wait for years for alleged closure in these death penalty cases. These are the poor folks who have to relive for a courtroom full of strangers their loved ones last uh, hours. And I'll never forget, I mean, this is so painful, uh, hearing a mother tell a jury um, in the penalty phase of a death penalty case that she, um, she felt that the, the bullet that killed her 20-year-old son kept traveling and it ended up in her own heart. That's, that's real pain. Um, and it's not just the families who suffer. Think about the defense lawyers in this system, okay? Uh, of course, they've got to endure seeing the pain their client caused uh, to sit and hear about the bullet that ended up in the mother's heart. Uh, but it goes way beyond that. Um, the defense lawyers have to sit in... Uh, with the accused in this horrid little box, his prison cell, for months. They're forced to pry from him all the most intimate secrets of his own tortured life, secrets that he never wanted to tell anybody, never wanted to remember, um, horrible, depressing, wretched histories. The defense lawyers become the friend of the defendant. Uh, 
you can't sit in a cell with someone for months and months and months without uh, discovering their own humanity. Um, the lawyers become his voice, and they're the ones who often are the last ones to say goodbye to him when he goes off to the death chamber. Um, so the defense lawyers suffer, but so do the prosecutors when you think about it. Um, these are the lawyers who have to stand up there and try and convince 12 people to kill somebody. Uh, that takes a toll. Maybe not in that moment, but my guess is at some point in their life uh, when they look back. And so it's not only the survivors, the defense lawyers, and the prosecutors, <coughs> but it's the jurors. Uh, think what we ask from them. Uh, these citizens, we drag in off the street away from their families, their jobs, they're reminding their own business, and we ask them to order somebody else's death. Um, and it's not just those folks. Think of the prison guards and the execution team and what we ask of them. The, the guards, these are the guys who live with the condemned for years. They bring him his food, they mail his letters, they listen to his phone calls to his family. Uh, ultimately, perhaps, and I've seen it, David's seen it, they may shave his head, dress him for the death chamber, walk him there, and strap him to a table or a chair. Every one of these participants in this system is diminished um, by this brutal sort of medieval horror show. Everybody lives with that memory. I think we ask too much from these people. Um, Anyway, that's something I've learned on my journey in doing this kind of work. Uh, okay, um, all of that out of the way. Now for the uplifting part, okay? <laughs> I am glad to have taken a second shot at Reed and Brian uh, Stevenson's book this year because there was something else that Brian wrote about in his book, maybe the most important thing, and it mirrored my own experience as well, okay? And it was in this passage he was describing his first meeting with a new death row client. And Brian was a young lawyer at the time, feeling completely inadequate, not knowing what to expect from this guy on death row. Um, and he described how he was feeling, which was not up to the task. And this is what Brian said. I had come into the prison with such anxiety and fear about his willingness to tolerate my inadequacy. I didn't expect him to be a compassionate or generous man. I had no right to expect anything from a condemned man on death row. Yet he gave me an astonishing measure of humanity. In that moment, he altered something in my understanding of human potential, redemption, and hopefulness. That's huge, um, and it's the greatest argument, I think, that we have against um, capital punishment that exists these days. As long as somebody is alive, even if they're locked away for decades, there is hope for redemption and a life with meaning. People change. You know, it's just like a little innocent baby, completely innocent, unaffected by the world, who grows up to do horrible things. Uh, a man who is guilty of despicable acts can again become human. Um, I think of my client, John Muhammad, uh, and when the death sentence came back in that case uh, and the jury was dismissed and the guards took us to this little ante room with John, uh, where we could be alone, uh, the first thing John Muhammad did was to put his hands on my shoulders and to look in my eyes, and he asked, John, are you okay? And uh, I will always remember that moment, and that was good enough for me to allow me to continue uh, the kind of work that Brian uh, has done so well for so long. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I am also delighted to be here today with all of you and especially uh, with my fellow panelists. Um, perhaps I should say I'm not as delighted as I claim to be. And the reason I'm not is because we have to talk about the things that we have to talk about. I wished we didn't have to we didn't have a criminal justice system that seems to be currently as punitive as as destructive it is. It's a machinery that we have created really to destroy individuals and entire communities. It seems to constantly demand human sacrifice and it's entirely man-made. The first time I saw the inside of a US prison was actually in my first year of law school. Greenhaven, New York. It's a state correctional institution, and it's a maximum security prison. At the end of the visit, which um, the prison had a joint program with Yale Law School and was strangely welcoming um, to law students. So at the end of the um, afternoon, we had a little reception in the middle of the prison. And I have to say, at the time, I didn't think it was as strange as I think, in hindsight, that it probably was. So you have a self-selected group of law students and a obviously selected and self-selected group um, of inmates uh, munching on snacks um, in the middle of one of the most supposedly most dangerous prisons in America. It didn't feel dangerous to me at all. Um, so I struck up a conversation with a young man who was probably around my age at the time. And it turned out we both had younger sisters. And that's what we were, what we were bonding over. It turned out we were both worried about them. Our worries were slightly different. Um, I was concerned about who she would be dating. He was worried about his teenage sister getting pregnant. I was worried about her not fitting into the Midwestern town where she went to college. He was worried about violence on the streets um, off Brooklyn. But still, it was that joint worry that brought us together. Um, we both missed our sisters, and that's what we talked about. And that's really uh, what ultimately Brian Stevenson is talking about, getting to know each other um, as people rather than as um, statistics. And it's really that we've lost sight um, of that common humanity, which brings us to where we are today. So I will actually be showing you a number of statistics, but I don't want us to forget that we're talking about um, people. Now, the human cost that we're exerting is immense, but so is the financial cost. In most state budgets today, uh, corrections costs are the third um, item after public education and Medicaid spending, usually well ahead of higher education funding. And oftentimes, it's actually a little bit fudging it, because that corrections budget item doesn't include everything. It often doesn't include medical care for inmates, and it often doesn't include huge pension payments that are coming much um, later on. Now, prisons impact the local economy, but they also actually impact um, and distort local voting. So they provide jobs, oftentimes in rural areas, um, where really localities should be working much harder on educating their population and bringing real industry um, to the area. But more importantly, because of the way the census works, uh, we're distorting local voting. So the census counts you where you're incarcerated, not where you're coming from and where you're going to. So if you have a large prison, you're actually getting many more resources than you should be, because usually the people who are elected don't really represent the inmates. After all, they can't vote, because in most states, um, inmates uh, are not permitted um, to vote. Now, you've all heard the number. We have 5% of the world population and about 25% of the world's prison inmates. Well, that's true, and it's terrible. But it's really only a smart part um, of our entire criminal justice system. And I want to be sure that we do think about the millions of people who are under supervision of the criminal justice system. They're walking on our streets, uh, they're shopping next to us in the grocery store, but really they're still under supervision. And then there's another large part, we're not counting them, but there are people who still owe money to the criminal justice system, and technically they're not represented on that chart at all but they're constantly still under the purview of that system. And really, 
Freedom is ephemeral in a time where we have collateral sanctions um, everywhere. A criminal record determines where you can live, whether you get welfare payments, where you can work, whether you can vote, and a host of whole other things we all um, take for granted. We know, but we should always remember how stark the racial disparities are in our criminal justice system. As Brian Stevenson notes, the criminal justice system in many ways has replaced other, sometimes formal and sometimes informal race-based controls. It serves to control and punish the African American population, but really that control has seeped into many other parts of our society. It certainly hasn't spared women. Growth of female imprisonment was more dramatic than in fact that of male prisoners, and it still continues. We also heard from Brian Stevenson that it hasn't spared um, children. But the interesting part about juveniles is that we actually have decarcerated um, that particular uh, group of the population. At the same time, the youth felony rate has fallen dramatically. Do you hear anybody talk about that? No, we don't discuss it, but it would tell us a lot about what is really going on and the fact that imprisonment and crime do not correlate. Um, in the way that we are often um, told. Now, in addition, um, we also have um, a whole host of other um, challenges, of course, in our criminal justice system. Uh, many of the children that were sentenced in the 1990s and throughout are now uh, adults in our prison system. That's where they have grown up, and we have not prepared them ever to be released. Now, much of the claim for mass imprisonment has focused on our failed drug policies. And certainly there is uh, much truth to that, and there is substantial racial bias in our uh, drug policies, as you all know, uh, because of the disparity between cr uh, crack um, and uh, cocaine, but also because of enforcement policies. But the reality is um, that Mariana decriminalization and even more treatment, though we have more hype, and reality of that currently are not going to empty our prisons. Uh, if you're looking at the um, outer ring, um, it tells you kind of the reason for why people are uh, in prison. And drugs actually take up a relatively small um, component. Now, that doesn't mean that changes to our drug policy wouldn't have a positive impact uh, on the imprisonment um, rates. What we're seeing today is that a fair number of prisons, a fair number of states are decreasing uh, their imprisonment um, rate, but there are still states that are growing them. So in the last few years, we have seen a small decrease um, in the prison population. So the Pew Research Institute um, said that if we are decreasing our prison population by 3% every year, by 2040, we will actually have the same incarceration rate as we had in 1980. Mm -hmm. The truth is we have not decreased our prison populations by 3% annually. That happened in one year. We're much closer to 1%, and protections indicate 75 years to get us to the imprisonment rate of 1980, which was still higher than that of most of our Western industrialized uh, partners, uh, but it still uh, is much more in the ballpark. Now, one of the population groups that Brian Stevenson talks and spoke about um, are life without parole prisoners. So the reason that our prison rate in, uh, escalated as much as it did is on the one hand, we had many more people going into the system and coming out of the system than we ever had before. Often for crimes that in other countries that we consider um, similar to us are treated as civil infractions or if criminal, they're treated usually with a, fine um, um, with a fine that's based on an income um, payment. Um, others would be considered patients. Um, mental health addiction uh, would make you a patient, not a criminal offender in many other um, countries. Um, the other group uh, that we're running into are people who have gotten ever longer um, sentences. So if you're looking at life without parole sentences since 1984, they have basically uh, quintupled. Uh, what I mean is life sentences without parole, but also uh, life sentences with parole, 
parole boards today are incredibly reluctant to even give parole. So even for those people, they serve ever longer periods of time. And then you've probably seen the people who are getting 200 year, 400 year sentences. Those are effective um, life sentences. Now let me just give you an example. If you were convicted um, of murder in Virginia in 1990, the average murderer at that time actually served 15 years, was paroled at that point in time. That is basically what an average murderer in a country like Germany um, serves today. Now today in Virginia, you would probably get a life without parole sentence, or even if you got a life term that was parolable, the parole board would push you out and out and out ever farther. And that's truly um, substantially increased our prison population and obviously uh, made our um, inmate population um, ever older. So this is um, what we're dealing with, over 200,000 uh, people who are serving these lifetime sentences uh, in American prisons um, right <coughs> now. Needless to say, those people are often not eligible for treatment programs, certainly not um, considered for programs that would ultimately prepare them for any type of release because we have assumed uh, that they will never be released. In fact, that seems to be the implicit um, promise. And as much as I appreciate the fact that we can find innocence, um, I'm not so sure uh, that um, we're doing anybody justice if it takes 10, 15, or 20 years. And in fact, one of the big problems that Brian Stevenson um, points to is the fact um, that there aren't enough resources for those types um, of people. Um, he says, if Judge Robert E. Lee Key hadn't overwritten the jury's verdict of life imprisonment without parole in Walter's case and imposed the death penalty, which brought the case to our attention, Walter likely would have spent the rest of his life incarcerated and died in a prison cell. And that's actually what worries me the most, that one of the big distortions of the death penalty is how many resources we have put um, into it, resources that we could have expended on probably hundreds of thousands of people in our prisons who are not guilty um, of the crimes with which they have been um, charged. Now, you will not be um, surprised to say, or maybe you will be surprised to say, um, that we had a um, counter development in our criminal justice system. So as our sentences have escalated, our crime rate actually has dropped. Our violent crime rate in particular has dropped. What we know today is um, that imprisonment has no impact anymore um, on our crime rate. In fact, there's quite a few studies that indicate right now it has a negative impact uh, on our crime rate. If we incarcerated fewer people for less lengthy periods of time, our communities would be healthier and presumably our imprisonment rate uh, would fall ever more. Now, needless to say, um, the disparities are even starker than overall in our criminal justice system when you're looking at life without parole um, sentences. The picture we paint, um, especially of African American men, is that of people who are constantly and forever um, a threat um, to society. Um, there's no study at all that would ever support this, and in fact, um, it is far from the truth. The sentences are absolutely and utterly disproportionate, truly for everybody. Uh, but in particular for men and in particular um, for black men in this country. So I want to challenge you to think about criminal justice in our society right now in a very different way. Let's imagine, let's reimagine the criminal justice complex for a second. Let's think of it as a public health threat. It's a public health crisis that we've created with our criminal justice system. It's basically a homemade, large, and still expanding infection. And everyone who comes near it gets sucked into it, gets infected by it, gets made sicker rather than healthier. And the first thing you have to do is contain it. And I think fortunately in some of our states and perhaps even in the federal system, we're now seeing uh, at least the containment approach. I think we're not quite at the shrinkage approach. 
Every day we're seeing hundreds of proposals in state houses of more sentences, new sentences, mandatory sentences, new crimes. So we're not thinking about shrinkage, but that's really what we have to do, and we have to do it much faster than thinking about 75 years um, from today. Because the um, kind of damage that we've been doing to individuals and to communities with this sentence, with this system, um, is quite dramatic. And only if we decrease it can we really think about building a much healthier approach uh, to crime uh, and to criminal offenders. A part, last, a vast part of that will be a functioning healthcare um, system, but also probably uh, decriminalization. Um, very different school system and a very different approach to how we're treating cities right now. So it will be a, I think, fundamental rethinking of society rather than just a tinkering with our criminal justice system. But I'd take even a tinkering for a start right now. Thank you.
Well, um, I will be brief because we want to save some time for discussion. Um, but um, what I'd like to, uh, Brian uh, Stevenson and I have worked in adjoining trenches uh, over the years. I started in South Carolina working on death penalty cases in 1980, which I think was about four or five years before he graduated from law school and started uh, working across the way in Georgia and later, as you know from the book, in, um, in Alabama. Um, and as a colleague, I've got to tell you, Brian is, I mean, there, he, he is the first person out of this little network of death penalty lawyers who suddenly has become a, a, you know, a media superstar, is about to be a movie um, uh, about Just Mercy, which I think is extremely cool. Uh, it often happens that when people become very, very famous, they get exposed as having feet of clay. Not this time. He is a real deal. Um, uh, every sort of moral trait that emerges from this book is the way Brian really is when you know him. He's a wonderful colleague and a very um, modest and self-effacing, thoughtful uh, guy. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is not so much the stories in the book, um, but rather what it tells, what it m might tell young people, law students uh, and younger lawyers about how to find your way to making a difference uh, in the law, as Brian most certainly did. Not in the 1980s and 1990s, because that's water under the bridge, but in 2020 and 2030 and 2040, when you are going to be uh, doing your work. Um, my, my main point is that in, in a lot of basic ways, the, the path that um, another Brian Stevenson would, would find is not going to look like the stories in, um, in Just Mercy. Those battles, um, I mean, you know, have been fought, and some of them have been won. Uh, and they're not going to have to be refought. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that um, the, the path looks obvious once the battles have been fought. But they were almost invisible when Brian was at Harvard Law School trying to figure what to do next and at graduates, in graduate school, the Kennedy School. Um, what he did was he went to where the need was and then let the need lead him. And I guess that's the best career advice that anybody could ever give anybody else, um, is to go where the need is and see what happens. Um, the, um, I've often heard Brian say that it's sort of in a head-scratching kind of way, you know, it's sort of amazing um, that there had to be such a big fight in the civil rights movement because you can't find anybody today um, of that generation who um, wasn't in favor of civil rights. Uh, it must have been like a huge celebration for R Reverend King and uh, Jose Williams and all the pioneers of, in the 50s and 60s because as near as you can tell nowadays, talking to old folks, they were all behind them. Um, you know, who exactly was it behind those fire hoses? Must have been nobody. Um, and that's the way it is once a battle has been fought and won everybody kind of comes around and says, yeah, I was always with you. Um, you know, I was secretly with you the whole time. Um, and um, the, um, but then you look at these things and you think, well, you know, so anybody to be on the other side of the Walter McMillan case must have been a lunatic. Must have really lost, I mean, how could you possibly, you know, how could anybody have been on the other side of the Graham case, that kid in the wheelchair, and thought that he deserved life without parole? He would have to be a monster. Well, no. That's not the way real problems in the real world look. They're always close, and there's always reasonable arguments on both sides, and there's always good lawyers who can make an argument in favor of cruelty uh, and make it seem perfectly reasonable. And in fact, those arguments and that cruelty is all around us, most of which, most of which is kind of hard to tease out because we're used to seeing it. It's, it's the everyday cruelty of our legal system. Um, the, um, 
I, some of you who know me may have noticed I, I'm awfully overdressed today, and the reason <laughs> for that is that I've just come from supervising two of my clinic students, four of my clinic students, in parole hearings uh, before the Virginia Parole Board in Richmond today. And the, um, one of the people that we had a hearing for was a 17-year-old boy. He was actually went to prison when he was 16, and at age 17 was in a cell block when a riot broke out. And he was convicted, along with two older men, of having beaten a prison guard to death. Um, and uh, it's not at all clear that he actually did it, but he was convicted in short order and sentenced actually to an automatic death penalty, which was then declared unconstitutional. So he got a break and got life. Um, and has completely, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the Shawshank Re Redemption, Morgan Freeman. I mean, this is this guy. He is. Um, it is 44 years later. He's 62. He has completely transformed himself. There is no trace of the 17-year-old kid uh, that was in that cell block in Southampton Correctional Institution. That person has vanished from the face of the earth and long since been replaced by somebody who is serene and thoughtful and well-read and considerate and engaged in his mind through in the outside world. Um, but he's still doing his life sentence. And he's been turned down for parole every year, year after year after year. Um, and we were there today to say, come on. Now, on the other side of that issue, you could point to there was a really bad crime. That's the last prison guard that's been murdered in the line of duty in Virginia. There hadn't been another one since. It's a very big deal. Um, and. Um, you know, you can't be having this, and what sort of an example would it set, and on and on and on. And there's a victim's family still mourns that officer. Um, this person should have been released 20 years ago, uh, or sooner. And in any other country in the world, or any other democracy, he would have been. Um, this is not a, necessarily a miscarriage of justice. It may have been, but that's unprovable. Uh, we'll never know. Uh, so let's say it wasn't. Um, he probably will make parole this year, and that'll be thought to have been a just outcome. And no one, I should, by the way, the, um, the racial dynamics of this case is the officer was white, the jury was almost all white, uh, and all of the defendants were African American. Um, but when he is released, that'll be considered um, the, the system being merciful. And while everyone may eventually acknowledge that he should have been released 20 years ago, it won't cross anyone's mind that that is any kind of tragedy. 20 wasted years of a, you know, really a person who has become a good man and could have been contributing to society and making use of what's left of his own life. It's like, well, he got a break, you know, he got out eventually. Now, the reason I mention this is that, you know, the idea of sort of going to where the problem is and trying to figure out what it is, what does that tell us? The idea that no one will ever apologize for those 20 years. It's hard enough to get the system to apologize for people who are proven to be innocent and are released. What, what about the guilty? And that's the story. Well, most people are guilty. We don't always know which ones those are. But statistically, you know, the majority of people in prison did it or did something uh, to get there, maybe if not exactly what they were convicted of. Um, well, I, I'm, I tell you this because I want to catch you up on what Brian Stevenson has been up to lately. Uh, he's still, and EJI, the organization that he's founded, which is now a really going concern down in Montgomery, still work on death penalty cases. They still work on juvenile uh, imprisonment and on prison conditions, the things he's described in the book. But they've also undertaken a really quite uh, a astonishing project of public education. The answer I think that Brian would give, and maybe he will even give it when he talks to the graduates uh, in a few weeks, um, about why is it that we are so casual uh, about the cruelty we inflict on people in the criminal justice system, is that we do not fully recognize the people we do this to as human. 
um, we do not view them as equal with us. And why is that? And Brian's answer, I think, is it is because of slavery. That's why. That is the historical explanation. That there is a habit of thinking in this country that goes back to the slave system. Why? Because in order to justify slavery in an Enlightenment country based on democratic ideals, it was essential um, to imagine that the slaves do not suffer as we do, that they are not like us, they are not equal to us, they deserved their station. They weren't really being mistreated because that's what they were, that's how God made them. We have letters from Robert E. Lee that say that very thing. Um, that was the ideology of slavery, and when slavery was defeated in 1865, that ideology lived on. Why did it live on? Because there was never a reckoning. There was never a time of apology. There was never a facing up to the, to the lie of racism that had been created in order to lubricate the slave system. And 150 years later, that ideology is still there. So EJI has launched a, a wonderfully ambitious historical project to say it's time to face up to that in the way that Germany faced up to the Holocaust, in the way that South Africa has faced up to apartheid. It is time, it is way, way past time for America to face up to the legacy of dehumanization that is what we inherited as the aftermath of the slave system. Um, the, uh, what, um, so, in Montgomery, which unbeknownst to almost everyone who lives in Montgomery, was one of the great centers of the slave trade uh, of, um, in, uh, in the United States before 1861. Um, Brian, in fact, the office that they worked in turned out to have been a warehouse in which slaves were held uh, before market uh, up until the Civil War. Um, they tried to get the city to erect a um, a plaque to commemorate that, and they said, no, it's too controversial. There are 57 monuments to the Confederacy uh, in Montgomery, not controversial. So they erected it themselves, and then began branching out and developing this idea, which uh, John mentioned, uh, of really constructing the sort of monument um, to, rate, to the uh, legacy of slavery and terror lynching, the aftermath, um, that uh, is not commemorated officially in this country yet. Uh, so that's what the um, that's what this project in Montgomery uh, is uh, consists of, um, and I think Brian's argument, and I uh, probably he, he can make it a, a lot better than I can make it for him. But since he's not here, I'm going to do my best. Is that part of the reason that we find it so difficult to confront the uh, cruelty? of the American criminal justice system is that we haven't gotten to the reason why we have so much cruelty in us, this lack of a, of a real concept of human equality, <coughs> of the equal dignity of every human person. And the reason for that is the history that we have not reckoned with. Of course, white people suffer in this system too. And that shouldn't be surprising. They don't suffer as much. They don't suffer proportionately as much. Uh, it's much more common for a judge to look out at a white person who has lived a horrible life and say it was otherwise blameless, as we heard a few weeks ago from Judge Ellis up in Alexandria in the Manafort sentencing. But still, the habit of cruelty and excessive punishment, once it becomes natural, um, falls on everybody. Uh, and that is why we have uh, an incarceration rate, I'd submit, that is so um, exponentially larger than every other Western democracy. Um, eight times, 10 times the imprisonment rate of countries uh, in the NATO alliance that we consider ourselves to be with. So um, I'll, um, I'll uh, close by playing about two and a half minutes of, um, of a video about the lynching memorial so that you can see what has been done in Montgomery. And I'll tell you just a bit about it when we're done.
me stop for a second and tell you what you're looking at here. These are 800 steel um, monuments to lynchings in the United States. They are not, each one does not represent a lynching. Each one represents a county in which there were an average of five and a half lynchings. That's how many they have documented. Um, 800 counties uh, in which lynchings occurred. And part of the genius of this project is that two of these monuments have been created. One to hang in this monument, in this um, uh, memorial, and the other sitting in a field waiting for each county, each of those 800 counties to stand up and say, we will erect this monument where this lynching occurred. We will come and pick up this steel beam and put it in this county. Now, it requires more than a piece of land. It requires people to organize in that county and build the monument, and then we've got the marker for you. Um, now, that to me is the real brilliance of Brian Stevenson and the real challenge that he issues to us. It's not just, here's what I think, here's what you should think. It's, here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Where you live, where you are. And that monument, that um, uh, memorial, uh, you know, em is emblematic not only of, of, um, uh, of this um, attempt to make us come face to face with our country's racial <coughs> origins and racial history, but also of that spirit of, okay, what are we going to do? Now, I just, I, I said I would um, not take any time, and now I've gone on and on and on. Um, I just want to um, close with the thought that um, this goes far beyond criminal justice. There are many, many places where if you follow, you will find um, uh, the, the wheel to put your shoulder to. We are entering into a dark age in the area of immigration uh, and the movement of peoples in this country and in this world. And there is such a desperate need for lawyers. Um, there's almost no right to counsel in this area, unlike criminal law, where there's at least the right to have a lawyer that goes through the motions. Um, and the environment and climate change, there is a need for lawyers everywhere. Um, the, um, there is very little effective demand because the need is not matched by the resources. Um, it's, but the opportunity to live a life like Brian Stevenson is open to everybody. And I think that is the real story uh, of Just Mercy and the lesson I, I would submit to be drawn from it. So, thanks. We have a few minutes for questions, discussion among the panelists from the audience. I've got a few, but I'd like to hear yours. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Professor Brook. I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you think you could make abolishing the death penalty more politically palatable in our national discussion. Because I think we're seeing a lot of movement on criminal justice reform, but I think talking about actually getting rid of the death penalty in this country is still something that a lot of politicians and, and people in general are a little hesitant to, to approach. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on you can hear the, his, uh, the question, it's um, how can we make abolition of the death penalty more palatable? I think we're making it pretty palatable. Um, after many years of not a single state abolishing it, we've now had seven uh, in the, just the last few years, and now we have five states, including California, have imposed moratoria and seem to be on the way. Um, it's, um, and we're abolishing it in action. There hasn't been a new death sentence in Virginia in the last eight years, and that is the third most executing state in the country. Uh, the number of, of new death sentences, which is a leading indicator, it shows where the people are really at. It's gone from 300 a year to around 30 or 40 a year uh, in the last 20 years. So it's being abolished. Um, in some ways, I really um, uh, agree with Professor Demleitner that 
it's been a horrible distraction that we have had to focus on the death penalty because there is so much else. It is so much the tip of the iceberg. On the other hand, if we hadn't focused on the death penalty, the death penalty distorts the entire sentencing grid. It's like, well, what are you whining about life without parole? You got off light. We didn't kill you. You know, that is the, the illogic uh, that the death penalty imposes on this system. So until death can be, you know, the power of government to actually extirpate uh, a human being from the face of the earth is taken away, uh, it'll be harder, it is harder, uh, to focus on all of the much larger changes. Uh, in some ways, I really think the death penalty is easier to deal with than the question of mass imprisonment, especially mass imprisonment of people convicted of violent crimes, and that's where the problem is, and that's where the numbers are. That's what has to be changed is the idea that you take a 17-year-old kid and lock him up forever and throw away the key uh, because who knows, he might, we're afraid of him. We're especially afraid of him if he's black, or super predators, and all of this nonsense. Um, those are things that, um, that I think are, are harder to address and the, um, the criminal justice reform that is just starting is really nibbling around the edges. Uh, and is mostly at the political level posturing rather than really substantive uh, changes. But um, it's coming. Uh, I think we're making some progress on that. Um, but um, ride for the help, you know. Join us. Other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, this is to whomever wants to answer, but how would you recommend maintaining an approach of advocacy for civil rights and civil issues um, in, in, in fields where it's not an obvious place to be that sort of advocate. Um, obviously, Brian Stevenson went to a nonprofit and then quickly branched out into his own uh, nonprofit in the EJI. But all of the industries out there that require legal professionals there is opportunity to do that, but at the beginning of our careers, low person on the totem pole, how would you recommend maintaining that mindset but also enacting change on a daily basis? Who's going to take this one? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one, one way. I mean, you, there's a million ways to make change in the world. There's a million ways to operationalize whatever inspiration you take from this book and other things. Um, one way, if you're going to be a lawyer, is take a case, right? Take a criminal case. It doesn't need to be a death penalty case. You don't need to go down to Mississippi. Wherever you are, whatever sort of firm you're at, volunteer, right? Um, and go into court. You know, you know, I was struck, Brian Stevenson talks about the, the level of uncertainty he, he expresses. He went to Harvard Law School, right? And, and, and he's describing how, you know, he didn't know what to do. And then what, what got him focused again was the proximity to his clients and the proximity to the system. And so whether you're working at you know, Debevoise and Plimpton, McGuire Woods, or whatever kind of practice you're in, volunteer to take a, a court-appointed case, you know, a misdemeanor assault. Uh, and that proximity to the system and to that human being is a way to affect change. I think you know, it's, there's 2.3 2 million people in prison and jail. You know, every one of them was put there one at a time. Right? And so I think just taking that step is one way to, to make change. By the way, I want to give a little shout out and uh, acknowledge that it may have been a slightly rhetorical question because Daniel Carlisle is one of the two students who argued the case today at the Virginia Parole Board for the man I was describing to you. Let me just, if you don't mind, let me give you another example. These pie slides that I had in my PowerPoint which are now kind of among the kind of recognized best slides that everyone goes to in the criminal justice system. The person who is behind this is Peter Wagner, who graduated in the late 1990s from law school, and he had this vision that the census needs to change the way where people are counted, that they should be counted at their home address, not in prison. Now, as you can tell, Peter is still working on this project. Uh, every time the census comes around, he thinks he's this close and he's missing the mark. But in the meantime, he's built an incredible not-for-profit. 
Now there were years he was sleeping in the mattress in his office, kind of worried about the water being shut off, not quite sure there will be enough donations coming in. Today he has a number of employees and a viable not-for-profit that does a lot of data collection. He testifies as an expert witness. So really with a vision, you can be maybe not quite Brian Stevenson, but certainly Peter Wagner 20 years out of law school. It's, a, it's an open question. Uh, my name is Mark Simmons, I'm a 1L here. Um, I was wondering, we, we often look at the life without parole as the more humane sentence for somebody who's committed uh, certain acts. However, it is a death sentence just by another name. Well, how come when we talk about abolishing the death penalty, that is often left out? Um, it's a really good question and there's no good answer to it. Um, it's, um, the fact is that if someone is serving life without parole, eventually the law can change and they can hope for release, whereas if they're executed, they can't. Um, so it is in that sense, in that sense, only a lesser punishment. But it's, it's exactly the point I was trying to make before, that the death penalty distorts our notion of what is cruel. Uh, and the idea that um, uh, that life without parole is a merciful punishment. Life without parole was unknown in this country in almost every state until 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Uh, it's a brand new innovation. There are a few states that had it, but they routinely, like Pennsylvania, but they routinely uh, had gubernatorial clemency to modify it. So basically no state uh, had life without parole. Now they all do. California has a whole array of life without parole prisons with nobody in it except people serving life without parole and no one has ever been released from any of them. So we have, um, forget the death penalty, we have created a, a monster uh, in this and it, we, we all know that people don't need to serve life without parole. Um, that there comes a time when everybody um, has stopped to be the person they were as a young man usually. Um, when they committed the crime, and it's okay to think about releasing them on parole. Uh, we know that, but we ignore it because we don't think that they suffer like we do. And a fair number of the countries in Latin America and all of Europe has basically declared it an inhumane um, sentence. So they won't even um, um, extradite in many right. cases to the U.S. unless we promise a life with parole sentence, although effectively you can turn that a life without parole sentence. Now, let me add to that because you sometimes hear this argument, well, that means the Europeans would release a Jeffrey Dahmer. They would not release a Jeffrey Dahmer as long as he constitutes a public threat. Um, you have, in some cases, the psychiatric system after you kind of uh, pay a retributive uh, sentence. In some cases, it is life with parole, but there is the possibility for people like that never to be paroled. But the number of people to whom this happens in a country like Germany, you literally can count on one hand. They have released terrorists who have killed multiple police officers. Uh, they've killed a whole ho they've released a whole host of people we would think of never redeemable. Um, but it's not an issue. They don't commit another crime, and so they certainly don't commit another homicide. Maybe we have time for one more. I know the library and Andrew have a wonderful reception plan for us outside. Any other um, questions, thoughts, comments, reactions? Yeah. To what extent do you think that the concept of profitability in corrections facilities and for profit prisons is a problem, and how do you think it would um, I think for-profit prisons in the criminal justice system are a very small segment um, of the entire prison um, complex. I think if we want to worry about privatization of prisons, I would look to immigration um, as the primary mover. And a lot of our legislative work right now and certainly executive action may be influenced by generous contributions in that area. I think on the prison side, it's much worse in the sense that we have so many private companies involved in our state prisons. I mean, everything, right, from health care to the buying of toilet paper has to be bought from a private company. Mm -hmm. So we have millions of people who are really involved in the criminal justice complex 
very indirectly, but getting a livelihood from that. So I think that, to me, worries me much more than the number of private prisons we currently have. Now, I don't want to see them grow, but if you want to put advocacy efforts into something, that would not be my first choice. I'd also say I agree with, with Nora, and I would say the other thing to look at is, um, Nora showed the slide, you know, roughly two, 2.2 or 3 million people in prisons, and another, what, 7 million or so on probation or parole. The privatization of that industry is something that hasn't gotten nearly as much attention, um, but that really, you can see a profit motive driving that population as that has been outsourced to private companies. It's a good point. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's uh, let's give our, our panel. A and thanks, thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, we do have a reception in the moot court lobby, just down the hall here to your left, uh, to your right, and then to your left uh, when you when you leave this room. And also immediately outside here, we do have uh, I think around 20 or so complimentary copies of Just Mercy still available. Um, so they're first come, first serve. So if you did not get one earlier when they were on display in the library, please feel free to take one. Compliments of the Law Library. Thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, hope to see you in the reception here shortly. Thank you.